what's happened? It's my husband, he's collapsed. He's gonna be gardening and he's just I see. And he's Did you see him collapse? Uh, yeah, he's only just stopped talking to I see. Him. Right. Hello? Hello, can you hear me? Has he any history no. of anything? No, he's normally healthy. And he's never had a heart condition no. in his life before? No, he hasn't. We got seven. Just collapse, sudden collapse at home. No respirations, no outputs. Right, and I'll set the defib up. Check see what we can do here. Yeah, patient's in VF. Put gel paddles on. Okay, there's no jury on, we're safe. Right. No GTN no patches, patches, right. Fine, charging the machine. Stand clear, shocking now, 200. Okay. Check for the pulse. No pulse. Stand clear, shocking now. It's slow. It's not it's Yeah. OK, guys, well done. Relax. That oh, was great. lovely. <laughs> if it had been a real patient, then I think he would have survived. You were very quick. In an emergency, the ambulance crew is often the first medical help to arrive at the scene, so training is vital. Well done. Dummies are specially designed to respond in the same way as someone with a heart problem. How did you establish that this was a cardiac arrest? And tell me, what did, what did you do? The patient wasn't responding, so I opened, I cleared the airway, opened it, checked for the pulse. There was no breathing, no pulse, so I started resuscitation. No pulse means the heart has stopped beating. A healthy heart is constantly and regularly pumping blood around the body. The contractions are caused by pulses of electricity generated by the heart itself. An electrocardiogram picks up this activity. Each peak is a pulse of electricity. Normally we'd expect to see this rhythm on the monitor, but in this patient's case we saw ventricular fibrillation, which means that the blood is not being pumped round the body. Ventricular fibrillation is when the electrical activity of the heart is in total disarray. The only way to restore a regular heartbeat is to apply an electric shock using a defibrillator. The patient's chest is prepared. We apply the paddles either side of the heart, press firmly and charge. When we've reached the charge, make sure everybody's stood back, stand clear and shock. The defibrillator and the human body make up an electrical circuit. There's a battery, a wire leading to the patient's chest, and a wire leading back to the battery. A small burst of electricity flows down the wire and through to the heart. The human body conducts electricity and completes the circuit. This jolts the heart back into action. Stand clear. But electric shocks can be dangerous. They're only used in an emergency, and safety is a priority. Could you recap over all the safety precautions that you took? You have to make sure that the patient's chest is, is dry from any sweat, uh, there's no jewellery. And when you do actually deliver the shock, when you've got the panels on, make sure that no one stood at all close to the patient so they don't get a shock off them. Why are the handles of the paddles made out of plastic? And what safety precautions do you need to take when you're using electricity? Joseph Swan and Thomas Edison lived at opposite sides of the Atlantic Ocean, but over a hundred years ago, both had the same dream. In England, Swan worked as a chemist during the day and spent his spare time trying to make the first ever electric light bulb. He passed an electric current through a piece of platinum wire called a filament. The electric current made it hot enough to glow. And putting the wire inside a glass bulb with the air sucked out stopped it from burning. But a filament made out of platinum is too expensive. I need a much cheaper conductor with a high melting point. As a trained scientist, Swan approached his problem methodically. Oh, it must be in here somewhere. At last, I think I've found it. A conductor made out of carbon is the answer. But when the carbon filament got hot, it burned. There must still be some oxygen left in the bulb. No matter, 
How hard I try, this old vacuum pump of mine just isn't good enough at sucking out all the air. Defeated, Swan decided to put his hobby to one side. Twenty years later, in America, Thomas Alva Edison was busy making a name for himself. Having invented the forerunner to the record player, Edison was a rich man, with the intention of getting richer. My next invention will be the electric light bulb. We need to find a filament which will glow when an electric current has passed through it. So, get to it! But unlike Swan, Edison was no great scientist. His team relied on trial and error. There were many failures. Horsehair! No. Fishing line? No. Silk? No. He even resorted to pulling hairs from his workers' beards to see if they would work. Drat! That's no good either. Meanwhile, back in England, Swan had discovered a better vacuum pump. In 1879, Swan demonstrated the world's first electric light bulb with a glowing filament. It took Edison 11 more months to find the filament he'd been looking for, which also turned out to be made of carbon. As the inventor of the perfect bulb, I'll be richer than ever. When Edison heard about Swan's light bulb, he was devastated. <gasps> if Swan takes the credit, he'll get all the profits. Edison immediately sent his lawyers to England to sort things out. Both men claimed they had invented the bulb, but neither of them could face a long legal battle. Instead, the two inventors decided to share the honour, setting up the Edison and Swan United Electric Light Company, even though they'd never met. From this factory every week, more than half a million tungsten filament lamps go out to play their part in lighting the homes, shops, streets and factories of the world. Light bulb production really took off in the 1930s. By then, carbon had long since been replaced by tungsten, a metal which is still used in bulbs today, and can reach temperatures of 2,500 Celsius without melting. And my husband was only saying last night, we must have another light bulb. Now, in the 1990s, we get through a staggering 2 million light bulbs a year in the UK alone, and take electric lights for granted. So, oh, what's gone wrong? To solve this problem, an understanding of how electrical circuits work is essential. How a biker needs to get back to basics. The electrical wiring for a headlamp is hidden, so taking the circuit away from the bike makes it much easier to see. It's made up of a battery, a switch, a wire going to the headlamp and a wire from the headlamp back to the battery. Inside the lamp is a bulb. When the switch is turned on, the circuit is complete. An electric current flows and the light bulb works. But you can't see electricity. So what's actually happening? An electric current is a flow of negative charge around a circuit. The battery's job is to give the charge's energy 
and push them out into the wire. This happens at the negative terminal. Imagine the charges are carrying bags of energy. As they pass through the light bulb, this energy is converted into heat and light. But the charges don't stop moving, they carry on, making the way back to the battery and completing the circuit. Electricity doesn't get used up. The charges don't change as they go through the bulb, it's the amount of energy they carry which changes. The current flows from the negative terminal of the battery, through the switch and the bulb, to the positive terminal. An ammeter measures the electrical current. It measures how fast the charge is flowing in units called amps. A current of one amp means that six million 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 negative charges are passing through the circuit every second. Reading off the bottom scale on the ammeter, the current is two amps. No matter where you put the ammeter in a simple circuit like this, the current will always be the same. When the switch is turned off, the current can't flow. A gap appears in the circuit, so the charges stop moving. When you add more bulbs next to each other, it's called a series circuit. So what happens to the brightness when there's two bulbs in series compared to one? The ammeter reading for this circuit shows that the current is now smaller. This means the flow of charge is now slower. Less energy per second is reaching the bulbs. Also, the charges now have to share their energy between the two bulbs. So, neither are as bright as one on its own. What would happen to the current if you kept adding more and more bulbs to the circuit? Where did our biker go wrong? Uh, right, we've got um, Coronation Street finishing at 7.57. That'll lead to a large increase, yes. Yes, and then we've got, uh, we'll have another one with the football finishing at 9.30. Right, and there's a drop in temperature of 5 degrees, which will increase the wind chill factor, yes. uh, plus a storm warning which becomes active at 1800 hours. This is a control centre for the National Grid Company. It's their job to make sure that whenever you switch on your electricity at home, there's always a supply. Sounds simple enough, but electricity can't be stored on a large scale. This means the National Grid has to work out in advance how much electricity consumers will need and make sure that enough power stations are available to match demand. Only by making accurate predictions can they guarantee that electricity is always available at the flick of a switch. Predicting when we might want to do something as minor as making a cup of tea is crucial for the National Grid. During commercial breaks of popular TV programmes, up to 12 million kettles across the country could be turned on, and such a sharp increase in demand for electricity needs to be catered for. Weather is another key factor. If the temperature drops or it suddenly gets darker, the demand for electricity will begin to rise. The National Grid monitors how temperature, cloud cover, rainfall and wind speed will vary throughout the day and respond to this change in demand by bringing more power stations online. Hello Drax, can we have number one to 620 megawatts please? Yeah, that's right, thank you. Demand varies throughout the day, but in winter demand is generally higher than it is in summer. Why is the biggest peak at about 1730? 
What sort of appliances are being switched on and how much current do they need? This is the cable where the current flows into the house and this is the cable where the current flows out. So what I'd like you to do is to measure the current using this clip on our meter. So if you'd like to clip it on. When no electrical appliances are being used, the current flowing into the house is zero. Can we have the lights on, please? Lights need only a small current to work. Right, could we have the lights off and the TV on, please? But his parents say they may appeal. The television needs even less. Right, could we have the TV off and the kettle on, please? Heating anything up requires a much bigger current. A kettle needs about 10 amps. Just think how much extra electricity is needed when 12 million people make a hot drink all at the same time. Can we have everything on? OK. The more you switch on, the more electrical current you'll need. It's 29 amps. The wiring in a house allows lots of appliances to work all at the same time. So how can our biker get all these lights to work? He needs to arrange the circuit in a slightly different way. Arranging the bulbs like this is called a parallel circuit. Two bulbs in parallel are as bright as one bulb on its own. Reading off the bottom scale, the current flowing through this single bulb is 2 amps. What's the current flowing through the bulbs in parallel going to be? The current flowing through each bulb in parallel is the same as the current flowing through a single bulb. In a parallel circuit, the flow of negative charge from the battery divides along the two branches, meeting up again before reaching the battery. If the current flowing through each bulb is 2 amps, what will the current leaving the battery be? And what about the current returning to the battery? Hey, success! But with all these lights, where's the extra energy coming from?